So, what will the Xbox and PlayStation 4 version of Civilization 6 include? Well, pretty much the same as the PC and Nintendo Switch version because it's the full game on everything. Today we're going to go over the basics, we're going to go over the key mechanics, key things, and yeah, it's going to be fun. Now, I'm basing this off the Nintendo Switch version of the game, so although in theory, you know, they could do something radically different, they're not going to. This is the same game on every console, so everything I talk about today will be relevant for the new console versions, and it will be the same for the new console versions. If you want to see more of these, if you want to see a preview of Rise and Fall and Gathering Storm and the key mechanics those expansions bring, make sure that you hit the like button on this video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss them. Also, one final point before we jump into the first thing is that if I miss any of the basics in this video, please feel free to mention them down in the comments. I will reply. So, yeah, it may be worth reading the comments in this video in case I missed anything, but I don't think I have. Funnily enough, the first thing you need to know when you want to play a game of Civilization 6 is how to create one, which is very obvious, Alex. Anyway, to do this, you head over to single player and click on create a game. They can choose the basics of your game, including who to play as. Each civilization and leader offers unique bonuses, so depending on what kind of game you want to play, what kind of victory you want to go for, it's worth noting which ones are good in which areas, what difficulty to take on, what game speed, which encompasses how quickly time progresses and how quickly you can research things, etc, etc, and the shape, style, and and size of your map like there's so much you can do to customize these games it's unreal and for a console game especially it's just crazy for those of you who are worried about long drawn out games on consoles you can actually go for something as small as a tiny map and a very quick game speed perfect for people who want to get a game done in less than a century i joke it's, it's pretty quick actually if you do it on those settings you can probably get it done in a couple of hours However, if all this basic customizing isn't enough for you, you can actually jump into the advanced settings, which allows you to customize even more. You can customize things as precise as rainfall and the victory condition, so you can really tailor this game to what you want to play as. As you can tell, this game really is a proper PC version of Civ, rather than the custom-made console version we got with Civilization Revolution back in the day. There is a lot to this. So after this, you should be able to jump into a game after listening to a beautifully read version of events by Sean Bean. Who else would you want reading that? So let's talk about what strategy is involved, the very basics of the game, really. So this game, at its heart, is turn-based strategy. Now, that might sound like a very simple thing, but it's really important to know. This is not an RTS real-time strategy game. You take it in turns with your opposition, and that is what Civilization is all about. There's a number of victory types, including cultural victories, domination victory, religious victory, science victory, and if you can't achieve any of those in the allocated time period, the allocated turn limit, you can always gain a score victory, so it's important to know where your score is. I'll leave links with more information down in the description so you can um, investigate these victory types more, but basically there's a lot to them and you'll have to build up a victory throughout the game. You sort of need to decide what you're going to go for pretty early on. There is, however, even more to think about than just the victory you're going to have to go for because there's so many things you have to micromanage, but we'll go through them as we go on. But as a few examples, you'll need to conquer diplomacy with trading and declaring wars, things like that, manage your income and finances, manage science, manage all kinds of things. But again, we'll touch on them where we, where we go on. So the final thing I want to say in this point is that the game is crucially turn-based combat, unsurprisingly for a turn-based strategy game. So basically, the combat works where you'll kind of have a, an attack on one unit, an opposition unit, you'll either destroy it or damage it, and then they can attack you. So it's very simple, and I'm hopeful that the footage on screen throughout this video will help that make sense. So moving on, let's talk about cities. Now, cities are so important in this game because pretty much everything you do is going to revolve around them. Now, throughout the game, you're going to want to have a fair few. In the base game, there's two ways to get your hands on cities. Number one, you can either settle them yourselves. To do this, you're going to need to analyze the landscape. You're going to need to analyze if there are enough food and production. Is there nice resources around a settling place? And there you can build your own set city with a settler unit. However, if you're feeling slightly more aggressive, you can, in the base game, move to other you move to other cities and use your units to take them from other civilizations by force. Essentially, capture enemy cities. 
Now, when you've got cities, no matter how you've got them, there's two things that you're going to need to consider when managing them. You're going to need to consider amenities, which is essentially keeping your um, cities happy, your people happy, and you can do that through getting things like luxury resources such as gems and little bits like that. Now, the other thing you'll have to consider is housing. Now, housing is very, very self-explanatory. You need enough places for people to live, otherwise they'll get angry. Now, there's many ways to manage both of, both of these things, but you just need to be aware of them right now. So cities are important because they pretty much build almost everything you have. Well, pretty much everything you have in the game. So if you want to build a unit, you build it in a city. If you need buildings such as monuments for culture or walls to defend your city, you always build that stuff within your city. However, the biggest change for Civilization 6, and one of the biggest things you're going to have to adjust to if you've played a Civilization game before, is the new installment of districts. Now, these are built external to your cities, and they come in many shapes and sizes, but basically this is where you build a ton of the important stuff. Now, there's districts for things like uh, military units with the encampment, science for the campus, and the commercial hub, um, which is good for getting money, and money is very useful. Now, although they come in all different shapes and sizes, there's a few things you'll have to consider with them, no matter what they are. So let's use the campus, for example, the science district. Now, this obviously works differently for different districts, but we'll just focus on the campus for now. So if you're putting a campus down, you one have to build it external to the city, so on a tile outside the city, because that's how you build districts, but you also need to consider where to put it. Now, different locations provide different bonuses. So if you put your campus in the middle of nowhere, you will get no additional bonuses. However, if you place your campus next to mountain tiles, so as hopefully the footage on the screen will help, you will get additional science. Now, that is just basically free science for settling a campus in a very good place. Now, these things are very powerful because if you manage to surround your campus with mountain tiles, you can actually be getting an extra four or five science per turn, something like that, which is pretty crazy. So you're going to want to consider these things. So once you've put your district down, you've looked at all the adjacent tiles, you've looked at what's going to be the best place to put your district down in, what can you actually build in the district to make it even better? Now we're going to continue working on with the campus here just so everything kind of makes sense. So you've put your campus down, you've looked, you've got mountains which gives you additional science, so how do you enhance it further? Well, what you can't do, and what you should do, is you should be building things like libraries and universities in that district. Yes, just like with the other science itself, you no longer build the science stuff directly in the city centre. You've got it all together in your science district. Now, to give another example, all your money stuff. So no longer does the market and the bank get built in the city centre, instead that is again external to the city centre, built outside the walls in another district, so that would be the commercial hub, and that, so basically what you do is you put the suitable buildings in whatever district it should go, and it, once you start playing the game it all makes sense. Next up, it's resources, so let's talk about the resources in the game, now these come in two forms, now these are either strategic resources or luxury resources and they work slightly differently. So working on strategic resources and using strategic resources are great for improving tile yields for example, so you can improve production or you can improve food that a tile is giving and they're also sometimes needed to build certain units. For example, to build a swordsman your city needs to have access to iron. Now, luxury resources, on the other hand, are primarily used to keep your people happy. Think about it in the cities. I was talking about you need to manage your cities, and one of the things to manage your cities was amenities, so happiness. The luxury resources are the first way in the game of managing these amenities. They make people happy. Just think about it. If you're in a city and someone brings you some gems, you're going to be a lot happier. So you need to manage both of these. Another element I want to talk of, both for strategic and luxury resources, are they can both be traded with other civilizations for either resources you may not have access to, or for gold and things like that. The other thing to consider about resources is that you unlock and discover more of them 
as you progress through the game. So as an example, your initial scouts aren't going to stumble upon uranium in the Stone Age, but many years later and many turns down the line, you might just realise you've had a rich supply within your borders all along, as they appear when you get the correct technology. Obviously, you can't work things like coal or find coal until you're in the industrial era and again have the right technology. So as the game progresses, you'll realise that these resources are used for different things. I think the previous point brings us on very nicely to the idea of advancing through time. So in this game, which is probably one of the biggest features which separates civilization from the rest of the strategy games or most other strategy games, you will advance through time. You'll advance from the Stone Age to a time beyond our current reality. So there's two ways in which your civilization will advance. Now the first way and the most obvious way is through science. So basically through science you will move from having units such as warriors, people with frankly stakes, to tanks, guns and nuclear weapons. Now it's always good to have the upper hand in science obviously because it allows you to manage certain things better and more importantly it allows you to crush your inferior enemies when they've got swords and you've got guns. So science is the biggest way really or one of the two biggest ways of advancing through time and down the technology tree. There is however a second major way in which your civilization advances. Now this brings in lots of different components and obviously if you want to learn more feel free to research more but the other tree to advance down other than the technology science tree is the civics tree which essentially works on culture. Now this is really important because it allows you to advance um, unlock, sorry, basically more advanced and more powerful government policies and governments. So, a few examples of how these policies can be used. So they can be used to help you do things like manage your cities more effectively in housing and amenities. They can be used to build certain units and construct specific builders, buildings quicker. So you can put a policy in which allows you to build ships at twice the rate you currently are. You can also fight more effectively against barbarians if you put in the right policies and they can also increase the value of your trade routes and generate great people points quicker. Essentially, you'll need to learn about these two trees to be successful at the game, but they're not too difficult and when you get on top of it, it can be really interesting to decide which route you go down. Moving on then, let's talk about some of the best unique bonuses you can get for your civilization, basically in regards to great people and building wonders. So the first thing we'll talk about is great people. Now, these great people come in a number of different shapes and sizes, including amongst others, I must stress, great artists, great merchants, great admirals, and of course, great generals. All of these different people offer unique bonuses and these unique bonuses come in two forms. Now either you can have sort of a one-off boost, you might for example get this with a great merchant where you can just have a ton of cash for example with a boost or you can have and use a great person's passive bonus. Now passive bonuses are a little bit different because for example a great general can offer a passive bonus of additional combat strength to units within their vicinity and of their era for plenty of time and you can also usually with a great general after you've maximized the passive bonus after basically maybe the great general has a passive bonus for units in the classical era once you're beyond the classical era and the great general is no longer of use because the bonuses are, are advanced beyond his time you can then use a one-off boost um, so either way there's plenty of nice bonuses to be had with great people and you should definitely aim to get them and, and utilize them. Now, how do you get great people then? Well, they are attained by basically three ways. So you can either wait till you have amassed enough great people points in that field and you will automatically get one or if you have enough gold or faith, you can use either one of those currencies to rush a great person. Now, that's a very good idea. Honestly, you'll figure out that when you should and shouldn't be using your golden faith to recruit great people, but it's just nice to have that there. Another way of getting a really nice bonus in this game is to go ahead and build wonders. Now, interestingly, these wonders can often give more long-term bonuses than great people do. So, let's talk about wonders and some of the requirements and things like that. So, we'll give the pyramids um, as an example. So the pyramids are a wonder in Civilization 6, 
obviously. And the bonus you would get from building the pyramids include granting, includes that they grant all newly trained builders one extra charge. Now, once you play the game, you'll realize that this one extra charge, especially early on, is absolutely invaluable because it allows you to harness additional strategic and luxury resources. However, it's not that straightforward because to build the pyramids, you're going to need to have completed a few conditions. It's not, I remember in Civilization Revolution, you could literally build any wonder in any city and you'd just get the bonuses. However, in Civilization 6, things are slightly more difficult. So, continuing on with the pyramids, to build them you'll need to have researched masonry, not too difficult, but you'll also need to sort of have terrain on your side because to place the pyramids, you're going to have to have a spare flat desert tile. Now, a lot of civilizations will have these, but imagine you're a civilization in the north. Maybe you're sort of surrounded by tundra and, and ice and you don't have any desert tiles. Basically, you can't build the pyramids, which is pretty sad, but that's how wonders work in this game. There's plenty of other things to consider when building wonders too. For example, to make use of some of the wonders, like Petra, you'll need a ton of spare desert tiles, otherwise you're wasting your time. So if you want to know everything about wonders and great people in the game when you play it, do remember to check out the Civilopedia because it gives you all the information on the requirements to build a wonder and also all the bonuses the wonder can give you. So always remember to make use of the Civilopedia. Honestly, it has saved my life so many times on this game where I've just forgot stuff and it's just a brilliant thing to have. The final thing I want to talk about today is the mechanic of religion. Now, I decided to put a focus on this because it is a bit different in this game to people, especially who haven't played any other PC versions of Civilization, so I fancy just giving a quick overview on this. Now, religion is not just a victory type in Civilization 6, it's also a mechanic that can really help you if you use it correctly. So you don't actually have to dive in and try and chase religion and build a load of religious buildings, you don't have to build a holy site, you don't have to build a religious district, but either way, you're likely to come across at least some of its mechanics. And faith is pretty much the currency of religion, it can be used to do things such as patronizing great people, essentially rushing great people, and also to purchase buildings. So even if you don't want to pursue a religious victory, it's good to have some faith in your empire, and you're almost certainly going to come across faith at some point in your game. So the very infant style of religion you'll come across is the idea of founding a pantheon. Most players, whether you want to go for a religious victory or not, have a good chance of coming across this early on in the game. When you found a pantheon, there's lots of nice bonuses you can get from it, so it's definitely worth doing. Um, but yeah, let's give an example. So if you, if you have lots of mines, or you have the possibility to find, to build lots of mines in your land, Remember to pick a pantheon that will give you bonuses for having lots of mines. And there's also like pantheons which help you if you have a lot of sea tiles, if you have cities built on rivers next to mountains, etc, etc. Pantheons are just useful for giving you nice little bonuses. Now, so that's very infant style of religion, but when religion moves into its adulthood, there's lots of other things to consider, and I'm not going to go into mad detail today. Um, but you'll need to unlock a great prophet to found your very own religion. Then you'll have to move on to recruit other religious units, you'll be able to launch inquisitions, and ultimately you'll get your aim is to convert as many people across the world to your religion as possible, and that is such a brief description. If you do want more details on religion, I, I just felt like it was something you should be aware of in this video, but if you do want more details, feel free to check out the links I'll leave in the description. There's a nice little video Civilization did which explained it in more detail, and yeah, so there you have it, I've done my very best in explaining the key points of Civilization 6 in as little time as possible. I could have gave focus on so many other things like diplomacy and other victory types, but frankly I didn't want this video to be really long. Anyway, if you've enjoyed this video and want to see more such as the Rise and Fall overview and Gathering Storm overview before um, release on November the 22nd, I'm also going to create a video on where I answer some of your questions on things like uh, will the game have keyboard compatibility and things like that. Make sure that you hit the like button on this video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss them. If there's anything you want to mention, feel free to let me know down below. Um, thank you very much for watching and I will see you in another video soon.